Hey everybody! It's another episode of Idiomatic's Top 3. With Nicholas, I'm the V-Game correspondent for Idiomatic. And I am Dimitri, editor-in-chief of Idiomatic.com and movie critic. And what are we talking about today, Nick? Top 3 most memorable marketing campaign. Ooh. So just, you know, stuff that companies try to use a little trick to sell their product and you know it was kind of different and you really remember it you know it strikes you as like oh this is cool this is an interesting way of doing things you know i like them i'm not going to buy their stuff but i like the way they did this <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's an interesting topic to talk about just because so much of what's going on in entertainment is marketing some of the advertisements too are very very bad like the ones you said at the beginning of youtube Mm -hmm. Where you can skip the advertisement in eight seconds. Yeah. And they make the publicities, like, they try and make this really cool publicity, and you don't get the gist of it in the first eight seconds. So, skip, and you don't know exactly what you saw. And, you know, maybe they should try and focus a little more on know, know where the publicity is going and, you know, give their message in the first eight seconds. So, I want to see what this publicity is about, but they don't even do that. Yeah, target it to the medium uh, that yeah. you're using. Absolutely. Like, is there anything that I resent more than having to watch a trailer that I don't want to see just to see the video that I want to see, which I happens to be the trailer for another movie. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> I mean, it's so annoying, but anyway. Commercials on TV. And you anybody actually sit down and just, you know, this is interesting. Everybody does other stuff during those commercials. Either you have TV and you skip them, or you go to the kitchen, you go to the bathroom. Nobody, you know, it's so ingrained now that I'm not even sure those are that effective. Yeah, well, they're measured that, like, if you get the flash images, if you, like, fast-forward it on your TiVo and whatnot, that actually people do remember parts of that, and they're starting to build commercials a little bit more in view of giving you those tracking images so that you remember the product that way, which oh, is that, an interesting strategy. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. So at least some of them are adapting a little bit. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a period of adaptation. The technology has changed, so the marketers have to change. But we are really grossly underestimating the power and importance of advertisement uh, for the industry. Like, I know a lot of people say, well, I'm not a, a affected by advertisement. And maybe you are, maybe you're not. But that doesn't change the fact that they are investing an insane amount of money in that. And that changes the industry. That's yeah. why we're seeing crazy blockbuster movies that costs $125 million because if you're going to spend $200 million on advertisement, you want the movie you advertise to look like it's at least close to $200 million and not look like it's $28 million. Yeah. And so movie makers now are, are getting pressured into spending more money than they actually need to make a decent story. Yeah, and sometimes for absolutely nothing, you know. Yeah. You did not need that CGI in the scene at all or some, stuff like that. It's just... Where did the money come from? So, uh, well, I guess that's enough chit-chat. Uh, might as well get to the discussion proper, as I often call it. Mm. Uh, mostly because I have a very limited vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. That's why you're a writer. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what is your number three pick for memorable marketing strategy? It's funny I call it memorable because I had almost forgotten about that one until I saw a video from Spoonie talking about it. SpooniExperiment.com. You should check it out. Very yeah, fun. Yeah, it's a cool concept. Um, it's a game called Microcosm, and it, I remember being in the video store and looking at this giant box that was kind of a square donut shape that was like so much bigger than the other boxes that they, it didn't even fit on, on the stand there. You look at it and I was like, this is a very different box and it's like, this is cool. And you start reading and it's like, oh, free t-shirt when you buy the game and you get soundtracks from like other games from that company and it's like, oh, this is pretty interesting. And as I'm looking through that, I raise my head and my friend gives me like this death glare and he's shaking his head no. And I'm like, what? And he's like, look at all the gimmicks on this damn thing that they're, they're, they're throwing at you. It just means the game sucks. And that's why they had to throw everything at you. They had to make the special packaging and the t-shirt and everything. It's because they didn't make a game. The game just sucks. And they're trying to sucker you in with all that extra other crap. And, I, you know, I kind of, you know, 
listen to his words of wisdom and put the thing back on. And I learned like m later on that, yeah, the game really, really, really sucks. But again, I was drawn to that box that was like so different from the rest. It was huge. It didn't fit on the shelf. It was like, this is special. This has to be something, you know, mm. unique and yeah, uniquely crappy. But, you know, that's what it was. That's interesting because that's emblematic of a lot of uh, marketing strategies like the cool packaging thing. Like, oh my god, there's a lot of that. Like, I, I think in a previous um, episode, I've mentioned the uh, weird uh, DVD cover for Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, where it was like a styrofoam replica of the Book of the Dead. Yeah. Which looks creepy, and I threw it away because it looks creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I just want the movie, people. Um, and you see that all the time. Like, how many Lord of the Rings editions are there? Yeah. With like, the only difference being that, like, here's a new box for it. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. The thing is, people buy that stuff. Like, I, like Dennis. Dennis P. from uh, the Dreamer's Edge podcast, if you guys remember him. He uh, he buys, like, all these different versions of these DVDs when he loves the movies as collector items. Which, I mean, like, look, that's a hobby like any other. Like, I'm, I, I don't mean to criticize Dennis, but he's like... Wow, that's like that is one crazy way of getting the same person to buy six times the same bloody movie. Yeah, pretty much. Another example of crazy packaging I remember was a Pink Floyd album with the stupid light that kept blinking the whole time. Oh, Pulse! <laughs> Pulse. Yeah! Oh. That was so annoying. You have that in your CD case and it's just blinking. It's, it's always something that's catching your eye and you're like, oh, well, I like to have the name of the, the album outside, but I guess I'll have to flip it over now because this damn light is so annoying. <laughs> and that like people like you don't know this if you're from a slightly younger generation than us because you download your music. But, you know, when you had those CDs, you had to put them on the shelf somewhere, you yeah. know, and so... If you were a little bit older, you had a one and a half, a studio apartment, or, you know, you lived with your parents and everything was in your room as well. Yeah. So that freaking blinking light, man, like, it's, there was no way to sleep with that. Like, I was in a studio apartment back in the day, and I was like, at night, like, that thing, oh my god. Yes, we're way past the age for night lights at this, at oh, this no. point, you know, so, and it's just blinking, it's like... Stop it. I, I love being in perfect darkness to, you know, to, to try and fall asleep. And that thing just blink, 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 blink. Like, yeah, okay. You know, it, it looks ridiculous. I have to put this thing upside down. You know, it's kind of lame. It ruins the look of it, but I have to. <laughs> oh, if, yeah. if anybody ever comes in my room to check my CD collection, I'll just turn it back around real quick so it looks cool again, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I ended up tearing off the battery from it. To be fair, that album is very good. It's not like, you know, Microcosm, which was a piece of crap. You know, that album was actually good. It was just an extra gimmick for the fans, I guess. Your number three, what is it? Uh, my number three pick is the Microsoft Windows 7 commercials. Now, to explain why I find it so interesting, I have to explain the Mac commercials. Yes. See, they've already stopped that for quite a few years, but back in the day... Mac took the world by storm with a series of very smug commercials starring Justin Long yeah. and some dude with glasses. I forgot his name, but he's on The Daily Show once in a while. Yeah, yeah. he plays the rich McRitchie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, he, and the idea here is that there's this fat dude with glasses who goes like, I'm a PC and my life sucks and you don't want to be like me because I'm fat and I have glasses and I pretty much look like everybody. And then you have Justin Long showing up. It was like, I'm a Mac. I look like this cool looking hipster. Yeah. That would and never fly these days, but yeah. <laughs> but, but that's totally yeah. what it was. Yeah, pretty much. And so you want Mac because you don't want to be like this ordinary pudgy guy with glasses, do you? Like yeah. that's, that's totally what it was. It was like this long series of commercials that was all about that. Mm. And it's obnoxious because it's, it's a, it sold Mac on status instead of the actual product. Yeah. And it worked. Like, I feel bad for, like, pudgy people with glasses, like, to a certain degree. Yeah. To be, like, the butt of the joke that revolutionized the computer industry in terms of industry, not in terms of technology. Yeah. <laughs> and Microsoft was, was sort of stuck with that because their PC image was now the image of uncool. That's what Mac was counting on. Yeah. So what did they do for Windows 7? They owned it, which was fabulous. So you'd have 
this series of commercials with these like totally normal looking people like this mother of three running around like total soccer mom style not having any time for anything and talking about like yeah i don't have time to this but like with the new windows 7 i can do that and then yeah. and she turned around it was like uh, i'm jocelyn and uh i'm a pc and it was so clever because it, it reminded you it's like yeah there's nothing wrong with being an ordinary person I am an ordinary person. Why should I feel like I have to live under the lifestyle the, of the the Mac, which is like super expensive for nothing? Yeah. And what it did is it made the Mac commercial obsolete because now when you would see the Justin Long commercial, you'd be like, yeah, I am the fat budgie guy, you jerk. <laughs> and it would just like, it would become a pro Microsoft commercial every time. Like, they just completely nullified the Mac commercial. It was brilliant. Yep. It's always annoying, what, though, because when you're the dominant one, any publicity for the other guy is, you know, if you mention, oh, we're better than Macs in your publicity, you're kind of acknowledging Macs. Yeah. Whereas Apple can mention PCs, because people know what PCs are, you know, I can compare myself to this PC thing, I'm a Mac, I'm going to be better than it. But when when you're dominant, it's, it's never a good idea to say... Well, I'm better than that because then you're acknowledging that at least that thing might be your competition and there might be something to it. So it's, it's I guess it's something of like, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity uh, that they keep saying, you know, if your comp com competition, you know, talks about you, apparently it's a good thing, you know. Well, yeah, if you're in the underdog. Definitely. Yeah, if you're in the underdog, exactly. That's what yeah. I mean. All right. So what is your number two pick for memorable uh, marketing strategy? Well, um I used to be a wrestling fan, and there used to be this big battle between the two major wrestling companies, WCW, and at the time it was called WWF, because, you know... The they, World Wildlife Fund. Yeah, because people really confused, you know, they thought they were buying WWF merchandise, saving the pandas, they ended up with wrestling, and I was like, what the well, hell? <laughs> in fairness, they were okay with it until the internet happened, and then they were fighting for the domain. Okay. So... Yeah, that's cool. But nonetheless, so WCW was kind of cheating a little bit to get ahead. You know, they were kind of putting cool stuff whenever ratings were measured so that they would be ahead of the ratings. And they, they re, you know, put really cool matches on TV to beat the competition ratings, even though their pay-per-view sucked. Mm -hmm. um, and at one point, I remember in WCW during uh, the show, the guy says, well, we've just learned in, uh, at the WWF there that... Uh, Mick Foley is going to win the title. So you don't need to turn into that. Just keep watching our show. But I kind of like Mick Foley as a person. He's a really interesting guy. And, you know, he's a good wrestler. So I just switched channels. And apparently I was not the only one because that was the first night that WWF made its comeback and won the ratings that night. Yeah. Just because they basically said, yeah, you don't need to go watch that. You know, it's it's... You know what the results are like. We know it's wrestling. We know the results are fake. Knowing the result is not going to <laughs> change the fact that we want to see it. And it was it was Mick Foley against The Rock, which are very, two very good wrestlers. So it's going to be a very good match. So everybody switched. It was really an attempt, I guess, at sabotaging them that really backfired. Because after after that point, you know, WF just you know took off and their their show the ratings just collapsed, and it was like. I don't know, is it kind of fair? I think it's kind of, you know, sucks to be you guys, but you kind of <laughs> you know, brought it on yourself. <laughs> uh, I um, I mean, look, we've just talked about it, but I do hate negative campaigning, by which I mean, like, putting down the other guy yeah. to, to get ahead. Like, I really hate that, just as a general thing. Like, not just because, like, oh, you're a jerk, you're putting somebody else down. Like, that's not the reason I hate it, because they're not people, they're companies, who cares? Yeah. Uh, but... Because it's the idea that you can't share the market. The idea being that if I watch WCW, then I'm not allowed to watch WWF. And the thing is, though, that WCW, their point was to try and get, not even to share the market, was, which was, you know, WWF was fine with that. Yeah. It was really to get them out of the business because yeah. they, they put their show exactly at the same time slot as you know, the rival company. So yeah, you're splitting the audience there when you're doing stuff like that, when you could probably just, you know, shift your to another day and one day I would watch this, the other day I would watch that. But no, you're, you're trying to compete directly with them. It is completely r ridiculous. And it, it was basically, the point was like Ted Turner, who in the company really wanted to destroy Vince McMahon. Mm -hmm. And that was the point of WCW doing, you know, starting the Monday Night Wars, as they're called. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it, it, 
it was a great time for wrestling fan nonetheless because both shows really heightened the production to try and get fans it was really really cool and fun storylines and great wrestler that you know turned in actors like basically the rock or stone cold stone cold steve austin were really really talented entertainers not just wrestlers but they're really fun to listen to so that that was great but on the other hand you're like why are you two guys trying to kill each other when there's plenty of market shares for everybody well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, like, I understand wanting to compete in the market because there's a fair share of your audience that will only watch one of the two because there's only so much of their day that they want to, or their week, I should say, that they want to um, invest in wrestling. So you want to be the one that they invest in for those who only watch one. Yeah. So you do want to compete, but there's a difference between competing and completely trying to obliterate the other one yeah. because the more wrestling is in the popular culture i.e the more people are watching wrestling the bigger the market is like the more it gets into the pop culture the more it is acceptable to watch wrestling and therefore it becomes a bigger market ra rather and you you find that like it's the same thing with the marvel versus dc like the the, the like the, the the schoolyard insults being thrown between publishers but dc does that uh, marvel does that it's like hey jackasses your industry is dying <laughs> pull together to make reading comics not seem like the activity of losers who would throw names at each other yeah. because they're from a different company. Like, it's so ridiculous. I know. Didn't they, in, didn't they have, like, the crossover in the 80s and like, the Amalgam universe of them, yeah. like, working together? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And wasn't that a good time for comic books at that time, you know? The 80s and 90s boom, absolutely. Yeah. And now they're just, they're, they're, well, they're shitting on each other. And it's All the like, time. it's like, you all, it, you know readership is going down and down and down so it's like get a clue guys honestly yeah and it's the same thing on the web like i mean like as a website i've i've tried a lot of cooperations throughout the years back before we were idiomatic and we were the dreamer's edge and yeah you know like the number of, of sites that will take things from you but refuse to give back because they oh, i don't want to lose your audience it's like do you not understand how the internet works they don't have to follow one site. They can follow both their sites if you cooperate with me instead of trying to steal from me. Yeah. Like, so I end up giving out of good faith for a while. And they're like, when I try to get back anything, and they're like, no, like, why would I help my competitor? I'm like, well, A, because I've helped you for like the past freaking year. Yeah. And second, because it won't hurt you. Like, that is such a childish way of looking at business. Yeah. It's like, and business should be for grownups. I don't mean to be a jerk about it. But like, <laughs> So what is your number two? My number two actually is also related to wrestling. Nice. Yeah. Wrestling <laughs> fan, are you? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, and in sort of an obtuse way, but like the thing that makes it memorable for me is that it's bad. <laughs> it's of really bad. But the WWE uh, got involved in an anti-bullying initiative back when bullying was the hot topic, which means about a couple of years ago. It barely. still pretty is, but yeah. And so decided to have like those little wrestlers doing PSAs going like, oh, bullying is bad. Now, understand what wrestling is? Like it was, the wrestling itself is cool. Like they're fighting in a ring. There's yeah. nothing wrong with There's that. Nothing right. It's a sport. That's cool. Yeah. But a lot of the wrestling is the theatrics around it. Yeah. And a lot of it is like people talking trash to each other. Yes. <laughs> Which, in the context of pure fiction, you can get away with, but when you have your wrestler, and I kid you not, that actually happened, go like, hey, kids, remember that bullying is wrong. And then no more than 15 minutes later in this almost the same interview, essentially, going like, yeah, my opponent is an F word. Uh, and, like, and in the F word denigrating homosexuals. I don't want to say it on the podcast. Yeah. It's like, it's like, no, no, you can't do that. You look like a fool. <laughs> yeah. See, and honestly, if it was just the you know, bullying is bad and the, the, you stop to that and you have that commercial going on TV, you know, oh, just independently, that'd be fine. That'd be that fine. would be fine. But it's really the trash talking that they do in between each other. It really looks like a bull, you know, schoolyard bullying. Yeah. It, it's less than that. It's a little less because they do it to each other. So, you know, it's, it's mutual bullying, I guess. And can, it, you know. Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's not as, you know, one sided as bullying typically is. Exactly. But in that, in, in interviews, typically you only have one guy saying, I'm going to beat the other guy and I'm going to, you know, pound his face. And it's like, and bullying is wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> 
ridiculous. That's spectacular. Oh my god. Look at that song. Uh, but, you know, that's the thing. With anti-bullying, like, I have yet to see a initiative that made any sense to me. Like, it, the the movie Bully was terrible. Uh, and um, even, like, when we grew up, we had after-school specials. Yes. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, who are listening are familiar with those. Those were aired, like, at the same time that our cartoons used to air after school. And it would have, like, a story about, like, this uh, little girl who would get bullied. And you'd get to see that for about 15 to 18 minutes. And then the last four minutes, she either turns the tables around or she learns that that was wrong, you know? Yeah, and, you know, she gets help because that's what you're supposed to do when you get bullied or stuff like that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that has become sort of the model of storytelling for all teen entertainment. Like, if you watch the Disney Channel, there's a lot of that going yeah. on. Uh, even the CW uh, soap operas sort of follow that model of like, oh, we'll teach you a lesson at the end and show you the wrong context for like the first 30 minutes. And studies show that that is absolutely the worst approach possible if you want to stop bullying. Wow. Because kids don't absorb information uh, the way we do. What, because they're not concerned with the ultimate lesson. They're not concerned with right or wrong. That they get from what mommy and daddy tells them. What they look for in the media and from the, their social circles is how the world works. Oh, God. So by showing 22 minutes of bullying until the 8 minutes of and then you get help, what they learn is that in life people get bullied. And their first instinct is to maintain the status quo. Oh, yeah, and they want to be the bullies, you know, because being bullied kind of sucks. <laughs> exactly. So re it actually increases the amount uh, of bullying in schools to show things in that way. Oh, wow, that's spectacular. All right, so um, what is your top pick for memorable marketing strategy? Well, uh, as I said, I'm a gamer. Um I loved Nintendo growing up. That was that was my company. You know, anybody that didn't buy Nintendo was an idiot. And Nintendo had tried and then to... you bullied them? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I was, like, no, I was very disappointed in them. And yeah. But <laughs> then Nintendo tried their, their hand at, you know, making Super Mario movie that failed miserably. But they got a better idea. Let's just market a game in a movie that's not about the game itself. And so they came up with The Wizard. And the wizard's whole point, I, I think there's a story about a kid that has some mental problems and he wants to go to California and the other kids want to you know, go to California as well and put him in a video game contest so that, you know, they they can show that he's perfectly normal because he can play video games. But that was not, the, the story was not the point really. The point was to, you know, watch Super Mario Bros. 3 for the first time on yeah. the big screen. And it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You just saw the movie and it's like, wow, I want to play that game. And it's like, that was the goal. Goal achieved. <laughs> that was just it. <laughs> and that movie was terrible, man. Like, that movie was so wrong on so many levels. Like, it tried to be the kid version of Rain Man. Yeah. Uh, essentially is what it is. Except that, you know that part where Tom Cruise and Rain Man is supposed to realize that He's not that much smarter and his life is pretty dysfunctional and he's a pretty rotten human being and maybe he could stand to learn a little bit from Dustin Hoffman's character in terms of his behavior because he's such a destructive person to use Rain Man that way. Yeah. Yeah, that part's been removed from The Wiz where they just exploit everyone they come across and then get rewarded for it. Like there's even a scene where they accuse an adult who did nothing wrong of molesting them. Because, ha, 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 that guy's going to get raped in prison later on. Yes, but you're missing the point. Super Mario Bros. 3. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean, but it's pretty expensive. Because, you know, you have to make the movie. Yeah. Which is pretty expensive. It had Fred Savage in it. Come on, that's expensive. Yeah. And then you have to make the commercials for the movie. Yeah. Like, that is, like, a ridiculously expensive uh, initiative. Couldn't you spend the same amount of money just throwing commercial after commercial after commercial? I mean, like, I guess that's why they switch gears uh, later on and just put it on TV. You know, like, they had, like, those game shows uh, back when we were young where the kids were just invited to play video games and earn points that way but really it was just a showcase for whatever new video game the companies were coming up with yeah 
So I guess that's why they switched strategy because that's way less expensive. Indeed. And to, to be perfectly honest, I mean, it was Super Mario Bros. 3. It would have sold nonetheless. <laughs> it's not like they were like advertising some obscure game that nobody's like never heard of. Like, I don't know, like Kirby. They, they just come out with Kirby and they want to advertise it. I'm like, nobody knows who the hell Kirby is. So what is your number one? <laughs> My number one, uh, as in so many different episodes now, I'm going to go back to horror. Oh, man, you're getting predictable. <laughs> I know. But uh, one uh, marketing strategy that I thought was super interesting is uh, that for a Blair Witch Project. Okay. Now, those of you who may not remember, Blair Witch Project was an independent film that had the uh, first-person camera thing. It's not the first one to do it. No, that was Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, and there were probably some before that. Okay. Uh, but... And it was like the whole gimmick of like, this is lost footage we found of four kids trying to film a documentary in the woods and then things did not go well. And so you're going to see this. That's the story of the movie. And what the marketing campaign did is try, try to sell it to you as if that was actually true. As if they actually took footage of four kids presumably dying and went like, hey, have some popcorn and watch that, kids. Okay. I I remember the campaign. It was a very good one. Um, who was gullible enough to believe that? <laughs> we know uh, we know people that are gullible too. Really? Yeah, I'm not going to name them on the podcast. But I, I want to hear after that. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, I, yeah, I agree with you. It's like, hey, hey, like, do you not understand that there would be far more outrage if the producers just invited you to see real death and eat popcorn and go like, well, they died something good. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh my God. Yeah, that's, that's spectacular. I mean, it worked. I mean, can't argue with results. And, you know, again, I, it's an intriguing technique because, well, first of all, in terms of its success, like you said, it worked. Like, it worked like crazy. Like, Blair Witch Project actually beat... Uh, Halloween, which was reigning champion as the most successful independent movie of all time. Yeah. Like for decades. And, and on a budget of like $20,000 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Blair Witch Project, $20,000 and beat Halloween that had been reigning king for 20 years. Yeah. Crazy. And stayed on top like for something close to 10 years. Yeah. Crazy. Absolutely crazy that uh, they managed to do that. And... So that's in terms of its success. But in terms of like what it is, like I find it clever because what it is is that they're allowing you to get into the story, the universe of the story. Like I agree with you. Most people are not so gullible, but we might be tempted just to pretend to be gullible the same yeah. way we pretend with wrestling. Exactly. That's, that's the whole point of, you know, wrestling is fun if you pretend it's an actual real competition. And I guess that is fun if you actually, you know, you get into the movie and you believe, okay, well, okay, let's see how these kids die, you know, and you, you know, even get just getting attached to the character kind of gets you into the movies a lot of times for me, you know, and you're kind of worried about them. And okay, now if it's really realistic, it gets you, helps you get in there even more, I feel. Yeah, it, exactly. It, what it did is like it, it executed half the work you need for suspension of disbelief for you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That reminds me of Paranormal Activity. Like, I'm just digressing, but that's what I do. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, Paranormal Activity had a really cool commercial as well, where it was just... Um, they got a couple of people to stay for the sneak preview of Paranormal Activity, and people really reacted to it, like, watching the movie going, oh, don't do that, and everything. And yeah. they filmed the people in the theater, and just the commercials were just like... Paranormal activity. Uh, people, uh, people seem to like it. Look at this footage of people watching the movie and freaking out during the movie. Nice. And I love that. It's like it's like it's as direct a promise as you can get. It's like, hey, you want to be freaked out during a movie like this guy? Watch our movie. That's it. Simple as that. Yeah, that would not have worked for Batman and Robin, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But no, for paranormal activity, especially if you like to be scared, if that you're really into that, then you see all people go, every, the whole theater going like, <gasps> which usually, you know, somebody jumps next to you and you're watching it, it's all, it all gets like amplified because yeah. then you jump because he jumped and you saw the same thing on the screen and it's like, Jesus, what's happening? And it, it, you know, and those were packed rooms. 
when they film, you know, the previews. So you get the whole room going, <gasps> and you're like, well, man, this thing has to be scary like hell, or, you know, and it's it's genius marketing. I find so too. And on a more uh, philosophical level, it sells the idea of going to the movie theaters as a community activity. Because yes. like, you know, with home theater and whatnot, like, what's the point anymore? And I think the point now is to be able to share this experience of a movie with a community. And that's why it's important that people watch the movie instead of talking on their cell phones and everything, because then you're breaking that Commun- social content, yeah, the community. Com- community bond there, yeah. Exactly. But, like, the idea of this commercial, it's, it's, it's selling community. It's selling, this is why you go to the theaters. So that you can be in a pack, in a room full of people who are sh- all sharing the exact same emotion you are yes. at the same time. They're all shitting their pants at the same time you are. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be one smelly screen. Eh? Indeed. That's why you like it. And you go to the theaters. <laughs> Smellovision. Oh. oh, yeah. With your little scratch card. That looks like... Scratch and then smile at the same time. You jump scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on that note, if you have any questions, comments you want to share with us, uh, some of the more memorable marketing initiatives that you remember, please write us at mail at idiomatic.com or post a comment at idiomatic.com just below the episode name. We're also on Twitter. We're also on iTunes. We're also on Facebook. If you could like us on Facebook, if you haven't already, please do. It would help us continue to generate quality content for you. Excelsior. <laughs> <laughs>